Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on power and utilities, how to improve power plant equipment uptime. My name is Jeremy Ernt, and I'm the director of power and utilities for Bureau Veritas North America. Over the past 12 years, I've been focused primarily on the power and utility industry and CapEx and OpEx initiatives, primarily on operations and maintenance, and then also on the development side of renewable technologies. I'm an active moderator, chair, and member of various trade industry associations. I have an electrical engineering background and also heavily focused on business administration. Bureau Veritas is a global leader in testing, inspection, and certification. With over $5 billion in revenue per year and 75,000 employees, we have plenty of clients and activity in the power and utility sector along our eight global business lines. Power and utilities rolls up into the industry business, which is comprised of 22% of our global business. And within the power and utility space, we have vast experience in many different areas for the asset life cycle. When you build out a power project, there's many needs on the design side, all the way down through asset life and optimization. Asset life and optimization. Different services that we provide are primarily focused on making sure that the asset has available uptime and is going to be extended throughout its anticipated lifetime. When we start looking at power projects for our clients globally, we primarily focus on the design and permitting side, which is focused on risk mitigation and identification, all the way down through due diligence. Another area of heavy focus for our team is on the procurement and construction side, as this has ramifications on the asset's life if the integrity of the components you source are inferior of what they should be based on specification and quality standards. As we move down to asset operation, our team focuses heavily on inspections and QAQC protocols, along with condition at assessment and monitoring. With condition assessment and monitoring, we focus on technologies that give us thermographic inspections, shaft alignment, corrosion assessments, risk-based inspections, material testing, and lastly, fluid analysis and monitoring, which is today's topic during this webinar. Fluid analysis and monitoring is a primary business for our power industry sector. We focus on our lab network throughout the world and focus on a general fluids and greases and oils that can disrupt the assets life and performance of rotating equipment and other ancillary equipment across your plant. The lube oils and greases are gonna be a heavy focus for the primary on the renewable industry, but on the conventional plants, we focus also on many different areas such as the refrigerants and the coolants and the diesel fuels that may be on backup generators. Today's topic is going to be primarily focused on the oils for your turbine, which is your critical infrastructure. And for today's topic, we have our technical domain expert for the oil and fluid analysis group, Jorge Alarcon. Jorge, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so um, I started this uh, OCM journey uh, back in 2000, 2003 um, as a reliability engineer. Uh, I moved um, through the entire uh, predictive uh, chain between the uh, jumping from uh, vibration and, and thermography, ultrasound, and some other PDM technologies. Um, so uh, today's uh, webinar content, we will talk about the turbine oil, how does uh, the turbine oil will degrade through the years or during the time that it's in service. We're going to talk about a little bit about a varnish because a varnish is a very common topic these days. And we're, we're going to jump to oil condition monitoring, how to identify the, the degradation of the oil or, or some problems that the oil can have. And um, finally, we will talk about the integration between oil analysis and sensors and the lab analysis. Uh, to put, uh, we will put this uh, through a case study that I that I that I had um, some years ago uh, between two sites. So let's start saying that uh, 
uh, in the previous year, uh, previous years, yeah, the the turbine oils were m mainly Group A, AP Group um, AP Group One. So uh, through the years, uh, the formulation changed to a uh, AP Group Two uh, with new chemistry and new additive chemistry, and this required a new analytical method in the lab. It was it was not easy to identify. It is not easy to identify problems um, in in Group Two as we did in group one. So what are those problems that we're talking about? Um, we're talking about some problems related with uh, byproducts generated in the oil. And these byproducts can affect the turbine system. So uh, we'll see a lot of uh, varnish, a lot of degradation by products. We can see samples that are cloudy when they they have they don't have water, but uh, that's a problem in the chemistry of a uh, of, of, of the oil. So initially when we talk about um, traditional oils AP group 1 it was it was easier to identify um, the degradation ratio uh, and the uh, oil service and life of that oil because we knew when that oil can fail. But with group 2 when we talk about uh, the new groups to group 2 in the turbine oil that changes are not easily detected so we can we can see change abrupt changes from one day to another and we can see problems related with that changes so where is the problem what happened with this new to with this with this type of oils so uh, we have to talk um, about the turbine operating operating conditions it's one of the problems uh, where we need to understand how the contamination can affect the degradation of the oil. And we need to understand that new, this new formulation is not a bad formulation, it's really good, but uh, the, the way that it works is different. So we'll talk about a little bit about the turbine of different. So what, is, what does it have? So when we talk about turbine oils, we can say that it's May, um, probably more than 98, 97 percent is just base oil. Uh, some formulations uh, uh, that um, are Rastin O, uh, Rastin O, RNO um, additive, uh, and some some others can have foam inhibitors and emulsifiers. So we're talking about a very slight concentration on additives on the turbine oils. So what are the the, the additives? Why the additives are added to the base oil? So the reason is to improve some characteristics, some properties of the base oil, uh, and to give new characteristics to the base oil. For example, the foam inhibitor is added to promote the bubble bursting. The, the emulsifiers added are added to the to the oil to promote rapid separation and water, or some others like a, like um, the rust and oxidation are 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 added to precisely give a, a large uh, life in service of the uh, of the oil. So, what are the turbine oil properties? What are the most important ones? So, one of the most important one is the cool down components. Uh, the, the turbine oil must have a high thermal stability because, because especially in gas turbines, we're talking about uh, hot spots and very hot uh, uh, points of where the oil it's it's uh, almost burning. Um, it has to have a good water separation, uh, high oxidative uh, stability. Uh, it, it it needs to be e easy to filter, and of course proper air separation anti-foam characteristics. So the general characteristic by type of a turbine oil uh, is very important. This, the, the, in some occasions, we can use the same uh, oil for steam and gas turbines, but we need to understand that the temperature is a problem for this type of oil. So additive and base oil decomposition are accelerated, and when we talk about uh, an increase in the temperature, for example, uh, the viscosity index improver are shared down more rapidly. Um, Microbial contaminants prefer warmer temperatures. Uh, the heat collapses the oil film, so it can cause an accelerate abrasion and scaffing conditions uh, in the in, in some components of uh, of the turbine. Uh, and of course, hot oil shortens the life of the filters and seals and can accelerate the corrosion uh, of the of the oil. So, Group One was a preferred group for decades. 
Um, it's uh, mistakenly believed that group two bays tend to generate more varnish, but the problem is that due to the chemistry of the oil and, and it's mainly additive an additive problem. So um, some manufacturers are still making group one base oil. Uh, most turbines uh, uh, in our days are using a, a group base two oil. So what is turbine oil degradation? Uh, so to put you in, a, uh, in, in this scenario, I will show you a case study where, that I had some uh, some years ago uh, in Europe. So we're talking about to, uh, a twin power generation combiner uh, cycle. It's uh, site A and site B. Uh, this uh, this uh, ha site has um, two gas turbines uh, with group one oil, uh, about 15,000 liters, and a steam turbine with um, uh, with about uh, 7,000 liters, the same oil in, in in uh, in both uh, type of turbines. So before 2008, um, of, of course, before the crisis, uh, both sides were under continuous uh, operation, no problems, working uh, around 20 20 hours per day. Uh, but they start seeing some problems after the crisis. So. Uh, the main issue was a drop, a drown in a drop in in, in in the electricity demand, and uh, the generation went down to 24 percent. And uh, some of the turbines, site A, for example, was online about 18 times per day. So they were cycling. So in 2010. Site A suffered a filter clogging. Uh, main filter was only about 20% uh, of its life. So as a part of a solution, they start sweetening and adding new oil, uh, changing uh, just one, around 1,000 liters. So they have to do this like maybe probably four or five times. Uh, on the other hand, we have to say that uh, Site A was doing a complete oil analysis only once per year. Um, so what happened with uh, Site was completely different. Uh, they were running an, an, an OCM program, an oil condition monitoring program, uh, and uh, based on the biweekly FTIR analysis, uh, they they found we found some slight chemical change in the oil. So that change in the oil is a change in, in so that change in the oil is a so we call that change as oil degradation. So oil, oil degradation is probably one of the most common degradation uh, mechanisms around uh, turbine oil. So probably everyone, uh, every every single turbine oil will suffer of this problem. So what is it? What is it? And 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 what are the phases of uh, of the oil degradation? So we'll start. Um, th the problem starts with uh, initiation. It's a chemical reaction that change the chemical uh, properties of the oil. Then we have this spread uh, phase. In the spread phase, it's a continuous and cycle chemical process. And uh, and of course, the, this reaction can end. Uh, it does, this is the ending phase. So the, the chemical reaction uh, will can, can, can take years to reach the ending phase. So uh, between 2003 and 2015, I, I did a study on, uh, on some uh, turbines in the in the European market, uh, looking for the causes of uh, degradation uh, uh, problems in wind and in in, uh, in gas turbines mainly, and um, I, I was focusing in this part of an, in the initiation mechanism uh, as a contamination. So, 50% uh, of the turbines uh, show a contamination problem with another oil, and we're talking about here about. Uh, mixing between gearbox oil and the turbine oil, uh, hydraulic oil. We're talking about diesel uh, found in the, um, uh, in in the in the turbine oil and many other fluids. Um, metals generated and in, and also not generated in inside the turbine, but added from outside up are around eight percent of the causes of the degradation. Uh, return it a uh, retainer air is uh, another problem that uh, that I found in, in in this in this study and of course water due to the process so um, another uh, initiation mechanism is the thermic stress um, so the thermic stress uh, 
as may is due by uh, electric discharges, for example. So when uh, some pipe uh, modification is done as down on the on the turbine, it can affect the flow of the of the oil. Another one is micro dieseling, which is basically burning the oil until the point that that's black, and uh, it's something similar with the hot spots when where the oil it's basically burned, um, and it it will generate by product. And of course, air. Air is again uh, uh, one of the issues in when we talk about turbine oils. It can generate foam, and that's a problem. But what I found that time uh, very strange is that uh, f around 40, 44 percent of uh, problems were related with changing in operation conditions. And if we put a uh, uh, if we put a context in, in a context this problem, we can see that, that the, all the problems are started after 2010. It means the problem started just after the economical crisis. So, um, how can we detect? Uh, and control the initiation process. So we need to run a periodic oil analysis, uh, restrict air inlet and UV light. Um, foam control is another uh, good tool. So it, it means that we have to be aware of, of the foam and the presence of the oil, detect hot spots and minimize the effect. Uh, in some cases, uh, some turbines can can fill the spaces with nitrogen and pollution control. It can this can mean probably adding a filter car or some other uh, type of control. So let's go back to our case study. At uh, the time when the when we when I found uh, the the site A was suffering um, some some issues with the uh, with the turbine. So I compare four of the basic um, uh, oil analysis that we can have in the lab for this type of oils. So the first one was uh, air release. Air release is a tendency of an oil to return to retain and traded air. So in this case, I found that uh, the, uh, the air release comparated between sites are larger and in, in higher in site A than site B that is showing a problem. The MPC is the varnish, uh, the varnish generation problem. So as you can see here, 12 times more in site A than in site B. Site B has almost nothing, and site A was full of degradation um, problems. We can we can um, uh, associate these as a varnish problem. The water was another issue, of course, with it around 10 times uh, the concentration of water on site A than site B, and some other thing related with byproducts is the insolubles. Well, Insolubles are resinous matter originated from the oil or additive uh, due to degradation or either one or both. So due to this um, situation, site A was uh, in the spread reaction phase. Um, you can see the, uh, this, the the picture at the top left uh, looks like cloudy and this oil has no water on it. So. It's all by it's everything uh, related with uh, degraded by products of the oil, and uh, you can see how the deposit of the oil was uh, filled of this uh, of of this products. The line, the dark line in the deposit, is showing a lot of stress related uh, uh, problems in the oil. So uh, we can classify that problems or that products as a, as a varnish. Um, varnish is a very common term these days. So what is varnish, and what are the effects that we can have if we have varnish in our in our in our oil? So varnish uh, will reduce the hydrodynamic flow of the oil. Um, it's an internally generated sticky bay product. It's very sticky. That's one of the problems. It can capture solid material, making it abrasive. As we, I'll have a picture showing later how can this uh, the, uh, the varnish can attract abrasive material. Of course, it's an insulator. It affects the heat exchangers, and they it, and this will increase the temperature of the oil. And due to this increasing of the temperature, it will generate more varnish products. So it usually has an acid chemistry. It's a very weak acids, but it's but it has a, an acid chemistry. So um, as I said before, we can see how the the varnish can attract and retain uh, um, solid uh, solid contamination, and that solid this solid contamination is really abrasive. So this is the main filter uh, of site eight. 
um, and you can see how the filters clog in due to these products. The, the initial thing is that uh, if we heat uh, the, the, the oil, we can see the difference at the left um, before and after heating the oil. So it means the varnish are related uh, with temperature. There's a, a perfect relation between temperature and, and varnish. And due to this um, effect of the temperature and, and varnish, we can find we can find different concentration of varnish depending on the location where we pull the sample. For example, the filter basket has a concentration of esters and uh, rust and oxidation additives. Uh, uh, the pencil filter, for example, in the AGV uh, system has a maximum acid concentration, and the main filter will retain will retain maximum concentration of varnish products. So different uh, different points of sample will reveal different problems. So. How is the varnish uh, formation mechanism? How how do we have varnish in 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 the in the lube oil? So uh, initially, a free radical is generated. Acid, alcohols, and esters are generated, and uh, the antioxidant additive should stop the reaction. And the, the additive will do it until a point that it, it will not be able to stop the reaction. When we get into this phase, we're talking about polymerization. Uh, the hydrocarbon change grows, and this uh, we're talking about very heavy weight and polar molecules with low solubility, um, and they generate more hydrocarbon um, uh, units. Uh, they can increase the viscosity in, in the oil on some occasions, and the degree of polymerization depends on the temperature and oxidation of the oil. After this phase, we will go to the solubilization uh, uh, phase, where the varnish is soluble dependent on the temperature, and varnish will will generate more varnish due to the chemistry, uh, uh, the, the own chemistry of the varnish. In some cases, we can have a precipitation, and uh, the varnish will, we say that it's a sticky byproduct, it will it will go to to temperature to zones where the temperatures are very low, and we have to remember that that we're talking about submicron particles here. So these submicron particles will will get attracted um, to some other uh, particles, and it will generate larger particles. These are really soft particles. They're not they're not hard particles, but soft. So varnish at the end is an is a non-soluble polar compound, very sticky, uh, especially to cold and low flow areas, like the deposit or the filters. Uh, they will slow down the mechanical movements due to their stickness. So one of the of the areas, for example, that, that the varnish would like to go is the pencil filter. So the pencil filter in the AGV system will control uh, the movements in the in the turbine. So what happens if we wash the uh, the pencil filter um, uh, with toluene, which is a dissolvent? So uh, in the case study that I'm showing here, which is a dissolvent, so I had a problem uh, with uh, with varnish. Um, the pencil filter was washed with toluene. And what we found here using the, the FTIR tool uh, is that uh, uh, the composition of the of the varnish is completely different than, than the oil. So uh, we're, we're saying that the oil transform itself, the oil and the, and the additives transform itself into something different. And this is varnish. So we, we are able to control varnish and some other uh, degradation um, uh, problems that the, the, the the turbine oil can have. So for that, we use the turbine condition monitoring. So basically, the most uh, important uh, reason why to do to run an oil condition monitoring is because because it can OCN can help to minimize high cost of oil changes. We're talking about thousands of liters here, and it can help us to uh, to reduce and schedule shutdown. Of course, we will look for physical, uh, physical chemical properties of the oil contamination not only solid particles but but uh, also looking for some other fluids it will control the wear that uh, components are suffering and the additivation when the additive is depleted and uh, if we can see some other type of additivation in the oil it will it will mean that we are suffering a cross contamination problem so how's the OCM trying to help uh, 
this the 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 power generation industry so we can see uh, we can we will try to identify molecular changes in the oil, very slight changes that are not easy to identify by, by human methods, but we need a, a lab test for that. Uh, after that, we can identify a structural changes in the oil when the entire chain is it's different than the original, original like the one that we saw of, um, as a varnish by product. Uh, in the next phase, we will try to identify physical changes in the oil. So when we get to this point, uh, we are probably in the not returning point because the physical changes in the oil will have an, will have an effect on the components. And this is something that we want to avoid. We either can be aware of a comp surface components or a chemical attack to the surface. But at the end, this can cause a turbine trip. So the changes can can happen in about a week, or it can take as much as years. And the example that are in the case study that I'm talking about, it can it took about two years to 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 generate all the changes. So let's go back to C and what happened to site A. So site A was doing um, a one uh, oil analysis per year, and it was just an oil analysis for them. It didn't mean too much. So through the years, uh, they had like um, around six uh, people who were responsible for the lubrication program. Uh, this includes suppliers, lab analysis, filtration, uh, and, and everything, every, all the tasks related with lubrication. Uh, they had no investment in OCM training at all, and they didn't pay too attention to the lab recommendations. On the other hand, <clears throat> we had Site B, and Site B was complete, had a completely different vision. They will, they'll, they, uh, we started designing the OCM program back in 2007. Um, we set up critical limits and alert for each for each oil test. Um, we run an oil OCM training and data review. Um, we develop a bi-weekly, monthly, semi-annual, and annual test. And um, as a part of that, we develop the corrective actions for each scenario. So they will really well prepare for anything, or at least for some problems that they can suffer in time. So the last step for Site B was to evaluate a sensor and the integration uh, between the sensor and the, and the lab analysis. So. From that point of view, uh, what can uh, an OCM lab can offer? So um, we can see that uh, in a monthly basis, we can have a very, a very, very basic uh, oil analysis package. For example, we can run a viscosity. We can run an FTIR to see if there's any cross contamination problem. We can run an acid. Um, analysis to see if there's a, there was a chemical change in the oil, color, appearance, or metals. If we if there was another uh, cross contamination problem or a wear problem, uh, particle counting to see if there there are um, any problem related uh, with the cleanliness of the oil or any type of particles that we can find there. So water also is a problem. Um, in a quarterly basis, we can have intermediate analysis like a ruler, which is useful to 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 evaluate the, the organic, which is useful to, or MPC, which is a varnish potential measure of the oil. Uh, in more in a more advanced uh, package, we can have air release, demulsibility, and RPVT, and many others that that will they will tell us the the, the situation uh, of the of the oil, the the state of the oil. So. Um, going back to our case study, uh, uh, the site B was doing site A was doing this entire package only once a year. Um, site A, on the other hand, was doing uh, in a very different approach. So, as a complementary test, we can have tests on demand like analytical ferrography or microscopy or or any other. So, all these tests are are basically here to to give us a a better 
a better look of what's happening with the oil. We're trying to understand the, chemi the, the chemistry of the oil, if there was a change in the chemistry. And if there was a change of the chemistry, we can expect to have a change in the physical properties of the oil. And of course, as I said before, if we have a change in the physical properties of the oil, we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll have a problem in the components of the turbine. Right. So the last step was uh, for site um, for our case study was the sensor and lab integration. So sensors are part of the discussions uh, on many uh, on many sites these days because of the situations that that, that we're having. So what a uh, what a what is the what is the sensor basically looking for? So dependent of the type of technology, we're talking about the sensor is looking for chemical changes or it can be looking for physical changes in the oil. So we can have a, um, a differentiation of uh, three different type of um, elements that where a sensor is looking for. It can, look in for, it can look for contamination, uh, particles, water, air, or it can look for wear um, based on, um, on, on degradation of the surface of a component or degradation of the oil, like oxidation, viscosity, density, or even consumption of the of the oil. So the current sensors can measure a couple of uh, things like particles, oxidation, water, viscosity, wear, and additives. Uh, one that I work with, for example, uh, was a technology that obtained and processed the digital images uh, to distinguish, it was able to distinguish bubble particles, air and water particles. It can classify the particles, the solid particles by size. Uh, it can generate an ISO code to see the cleanliness of the oil. And uh, it can determine the type of individual size and shape. At the same time, this sensor was able to give uh, uh, an oxidation uh, uh, approximately uh, parameters. So we can see if the oil was kind of oxidizing or showing any degradation problems. So once we installed the sensor in the, in, the, in the turbine, we were able to find a slight change in the chemistry behavior of the oil. So at that time, we were comparing the oxidation, um, the oil oil degradation, uh, with particles larger than than fourteen than four microns. So you can see in the black line, there's a slight change. There's a, a, an unusual generation of uh, particles um, classified as uh, four microns particles. So uh, this this was a trigger for us. And um, we 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 pull a sample. So this sample was on a schedule lab analysis. It was not the time for this uh, for this analysis, but it triggered the the sensor triggered a problem very in a very er early stage, and it helped us to understand what was happening with the oil. So. Um, we're talking about here about the, the, the sensors can measure the particle size classification. Uh, it can identify the root cause in some cases. It can, uh, we can have a, a, a better scenario of if it's a water uh, bubble or it's an air bubble. And at some point, we can, it, the sensor can identify uh, the degradation of the oil. And we're talking about varnish in this case. So. Going back to our case study, we have our site B that install a sensor uh, in, in in the turbine. So you can see the sensor is a black box in the um, in the before the oil filter uh, uh, in the in the dry sump gas turbine lubrication system. So. Um, what well, the sensor was able to identify and to measure uh, the condition of the machine based on the different regimes of energy production. And uh, it could be seen in the graph that in the daily cyclic behavior uh, presented of the wear particles ca caused by operation of the machine. So we found three peaks that are very obviously to see there. So uh, we asked what, what are those peaks uh, that the, the turbine is suffering? So those peaks can be classified as a particle the the turbine in the in the turbine so uh, if we don't want to move about from there we can say that 
is just particle generation uh, inside the, the turbine, but uh, the sensor technology these days can help us to understand some other things. So particle sensors uh, should be used in a different way, not just to measure the cleanliness of the oil, but trying to understand how the particle uh, generation inter internally um, can affect the, the reliability of the equipment. So we have, uh, we, we, we plot all the all the uh, all the data that we came uh, that the sensor gave us, and uh, we uh, what we did is uh, also put it in the same graph with the with the rest of the lab analysis, and we were able to identify an abnormal zone based on the generator speed and the particle generation. Um, so uh, the red part of the graph shows uh, uh, the potential wear of the. Uh, of the components of the turbine. Uh, in, in, in in yellow, we can see that uh, when the, the speed is high, uh, uh, we can find uh, another different type of, of situation. It is an abnormal zone, but uh, there's no potential wear of, uh, of the components. And of course, the normal operation zone where, where the, the, the turbine should be, uh, should be working. All right, and this take us to the questions uh, and answers. First question, I'm going to toss this over to Jorge. Um, it's asking, uh, do we have uh, best practice standards for oil sampling frequency? Um, for example, when when to change the oil instead of sweeten and, and things of those standards? When we talk about uh, sampling frequency, uh, we have to start um, with uh, what, what the OEM uh, basically uh, recommends. Uh, we can also have the lab recommendation or the loop supplier recommendation on when, uh, when is a good time to, to sample. But um, after that, we have to develop our own um, frequency, uh, frequency time. So we need to, we need to pay attention of uh, the oil failure mode and how is the oil uh, prone to fail. So based on that, we have to develop our own frequency and our own sli um, a slide of, uh, of test that we have to to run in the in the lab. So basically, it, we we will start with a uh, with something with something that they all recommends, but we have to move based on the, the turbine necessities. Okay. Right. I have another question. Um, somebody sent it to me uh, by email yesterday, and I, I would like to answer that before. So, uh, what recommendations can you make for the oil that uh, we have a store during this time in our storage? So, um, first of all, we have to remember that uh, oil is uh, highly hydroscopic. It, it, the water is very attracted to oil, and um, probably this is one of the most important issues when uh, we have oil uh, under storage. Um, drums or uh, totters need to need to breathe even when they are um, when they are closed so it's necessary to reduce the entry of the contamination uh, by any means uh, we can go from just a, a fireproof uh, or waterproof blanket to up a, a filtration system um, another good recommendation is to use a proper identification system um, with the with the product's entry date especially so after the the 2008 crisis, I found a lot of industries and sites with a very large stock of lubricants, oil and graces, of course, uh, um, and uh, they have no information on, on when the drums uh, had entered into the, the storage or in some cases, uh, what type of oil was in that drum. So it's very important to have this information in the in the uh, recording somewhere. Okay, great. Um, another Another question, I think most of these are going to be pointed towards you. Is is somebody's asking about FTIR? What is that process? So FTIR, um, FTIR is a uh, is the fingerprint. We, we can you, you can we can say that as the fingerprint of the oil. Uh, if we re, if we can go back to as one of those slides, we can see the difference between uh, the varnish FTIR and the and the and the oil FTIR. So it will it will give us the. Uh, the chemical composition of the oil in a different way. So is the is the fingerprint is very important. Um, one of the problems that I found is that people mainly use it just for oxidation uh, control, 
and of course is 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 the preferred method to measure oxidation but uh, there's a lot of things that we can uh, we can um, we can have from the FTIR so the FTIR is a very very important tool in 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 a good lab uh, oil analysis okay uh, next question is will we get a copy of the presentation the answer is yes uh, as far as digital format this is going to be um, allowable on demand um, you're able to access it through our um, through our webinar portal on our on our website. Um, I don't think we're able to give physical copies, but uh, if you want to interact with us um, after this, I'm sure we can share some content and uh, things of that nature. So no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, next next question. I have another one, Jeremy. Sorry, I have another one. Um, how do I select the cor the correct varnish uh, removal technology? So to answer that question, you need first to have a technological allied, in this case, an oil analysis a lab uh, on your site, working on your site. So the next step is to identify the oil failure mode. Uh, in other words, um, it's how the varnish is generated in the system. Um, uh, is, uh, is this because a, a a physical mechanical problem or is a, a chemical problem. So remember that varnish is the, the end of a reaction, is at the end of a chemical reaction. So the the uh, one of the um, the OCM uh, objective is to find the source of that reaction. So if the solution is adding some type of chemical product, uh, it's necessary, it's highly recommended to do some initial lab test uh, to check comp compatibility, for example, or some other some other basic test. Uh, if the solution is adding a filter car, try to do it with a, a small volume of oil in service first, like a toddy of, um, I don't know, 1,000 liters. And after that, check in if, the, if the, 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 the filter car is working and the, the, the chemical reaction or the problems is stop. Um, I remember a case uh, that I had so many years, um, some years ago with two gas turbines using the same oil and they have varnish problems. Uh, after using the same technology, exactly the same technology, um, one, the varnish of one of the gas turbines disappear and the other remain. So it's very important to, to follow a process, not just buying or, or rent a card, a filter card, without knowing the, what the problem is. OK, nice. Um, and, and actually, our, our team corrected me there uh, for, the, for everybody viewing. You are going to get a PDF copy of the presentation um, and, and the webinar recording, so everybody will have access to that. Yeah, that's um, correct. Yeah. Okay, and that um, let's take a look here. There's a question about anti foam advantage between SI or non SI type anti foam agents. Can you can you handle that question? Yeah. So uh, the most important one is the um, this the non silicon anti foam additives are dissolved in the oil. So the, we're talking about organic in this case. So the problem with uh, uh, with anti foam based on silicon is that um, is not dissolved, so it can go down to the uh, to the bottom of the drum when the drum is not in. Uh, I mean, when the oil is not in service, and uh, sometimes you can add a, uh, the oil, but the I don't know a large percentage of the of the additive it, it it will it will remain at the bottom of the drum. So you are basically not adding that additive to the uh, to the to the system to the turbine system or any other uh, type of equipment. Okay. Did we did we handle this one as far as removing varnish uh, deposit in the sump bottom in the walls? Which is the better method? Yeah, I think I answered that before with saying uh, with explaining the process of uh, how to choose a. Uh, um, yeah. A technology. I have another one. Um, how long does my lubricant last in storage? Uh, so, for some reason, this is probably the most common questions uh, during these days. How long my my lubricant will 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 last? Um, so the answer will depend on who you ask uh, this question. So the most common answer is saying that for oils, uh, it about is about two years, and for greases is about about one year. Um, but in 2014, I had a, a um, I had a, during an audit site, uh, I found 92 drums of uh, lubricants 
different oil and greases. The oldest drum at that time was uh, from 1996, if I remember correct. And uh, the newest one was one year before that, so 2013. So about uh, 16, 17 years of difference between the, the oldest and the newest and, and the new oil. So um, in the storage room, I found uh, gearbox, turbine, hydraulic, compressor oils, and many different type of greases. So after the lab analysis um, of almost all of the drums, I found that uh, some of the oldest um, oils there were still in, uh, still in, uh, still fit for service, and some of the new ones high high contamination have had, had contamination of uh, water mainly. So my recommendation is. Uh, yeah, you can you can say that two years for oils, one year for greases. But my recommendation is, in this kind of situation, run a basic test analysis in the lab before uh, putting the the lubricant in service. Nice, nice. Okay. Um, there's another one that popped up. I think it populated earlier. Uh, we weren't able to get to it. it. Talks about the reasoning between green type of varnish formed on the metal surface, uh, although there's less chance of water contact. Okay, so uh, in the cases that I that I had um, varnish, uh, var I mean green, that that green varnish color uh, was due to high water concentration. Even if the the water is not present uh, as a as a water, but the, we can we can see that the concentration is measured in ppm. So um, beside water concentration in that varnish, uh, there was a high concentration in in acids. And uh, that's one of the the reasons that the, the surface of the component was attacked and was suffered corrosion. So, I uh, there's a couple of more um, situations where you can have that, that type of uh, green color. And it's also due to uh, different additives, depletion of the of, of the additives. But yeah. Okay. I think that handles all of the questions from the Q and A mode here. Um, if there's anything else, um, you all can feel free to reach out to us via email, um, which will be provided to you as well. And um, we'll look forward to uh, hearing from everybody in the future and hope everybody stays safe and uh, stay healthy out there and uh, have a great rest of the day. And thank you, Jorge, for the presentation. Uh, very good. And uh, have a great week, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you all for your presence. Have a good day.